Okay, so today we will be talking about acute aortic syndrome. So we will discuss aortic aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms, dissection, intramural hematoma, penetrating aortic ulcer, and thoracic aortic injury. So starting with aortic aneurysms, we know by the law of Laplace that uh, as the radius of the blood vessel increases, uh, the tension on the wall increases, which then increases the risk of rupture for the aorta. And our definitions are for aneurysm, ascending aorta greater than four centimeters, descending aorta greater than three. True aneurysm contains all layers of the aortic wall. A pseudoaneurysm, there is no intima in the wall of the aneurysm. So aneurysms may be fusiform, where we have symmetric radial dilatation, as in this example, or saccular, where we have eccentric dilatation involving uh, one side of the aorta. Uh, most mycotic aneurysms are saccular. And thoracic aneurysms greater than six centimeters in diameter have five times increased risk for rupture. So once an aneurysm gets to five centimeters, we start to think about surgical therapy there. So for aortic aneurysms uh, on chest radiograph, here's an extreme example, a mass that you can't separate uh, from the aorta. Easy diagnosis with CT when we're dealing with these aortic aneurysms. So they can be thrombus within the wall of the aneurysms. Uh, if, we see, uh, if we see hematoma outside of the aneurysm, as in this example, then we know that there has been rupture of the aneurysm. On non-contrast imaging, acute thrombus within the wall of the aneurysm can also be an indication of impending rupture or rupture as in this example. So we see this crescent of increased attenuation along the wall of the aneurysm. This represents acute thrombus within the wall of the aneurysm and in this patient there is also some hematoma here in the mediastinum indicating that this aneurysm has rupture. Now what do we think of this case? Here we have a uh, black blood uh, MRI here, a sagittal view, MRI angiography here and then here we have bright blood imaging here looking at the outflow tract of the left ventricle and the aortic valve. We notice that there is dilatation of the ascending aorta extending all the way down to the aortic root to the sinuses of Valsalva. And here on the bright blood imaging, we can see that there's aortic valvular regurgitation. So this is an example of annular aortic ectasia. So this is associated with cystic medial necrosis that causes progressive dilatation of the aortic annulus, sinus of Valsalva, and the proximal ascending aorta. Complications of this are dissection and aortic regurgitation, as we have seen in this example, and of course, rupture of the aorta. This is associated with Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So with annular aortic ectasia, we will see dilatation extending all the way down involving the sinuses of Valsalva. You want to be able to differentiate that from a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, as in this uh, diagram here that uh, is only dilatation isolated to the sinus of Valsalva. So your normal sinuses of Valsalva, when you follow them up, you have the sinotubular junction here, and that's the transition to the ascending aorta. So with annular aortic ectasia, we will see dilated sinuses of Valsalva. There's dilated ascending aorta. And commonly, whenever you get dilatation, especially uh, whenever you get dilatation of the ascending aorta, especially near the aortic root, you can develop aortic valvular regurgitation. So here are some dilated sinus of Valsalva here on the CT. You can see the ascending aorta is also slightly dilated, but not quite as bad as the sinuses of Valsalva in this example. There's a particular sign demonstrated very nicely on this coronal reformatted CT image, and that sign is the tulip bulb sign. This is a sign of annular aortic ectasia. And as we've said, this can be associated with Marfan's. The differential diagnosis for aneurysms of the ascending aorta, we have annual aortic ectasia, aortitis, Takayasu syphilis trauma, including coronary artery bypass grafts. So during the procedure, they will place a cannula in the ascending aorta for cardiopulmonary bypass. After surgery, patients might develop a complication of the ascending aorta, such as pseudoaneurysm formation. So let's move on to our next case. So on this non-contrast CT, I hope all of you can notice the displaced intimal calcification. And you can also make out the dissection flap here. So in this example, we can make the diagnosis of dissection of the aorta on this non-contrast image. So dissection of the aorta, 
Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. When we have separation of the aortic media by a stream of blood, so that creates two channels. We have a true lumen and a false lumen separated by this intimal flap. And that flap contains intima and an inner portion of the media, predisposing factors, hypertension, Marfan's, Turner's, Eller, Danlos. Now, dissections can be divided into acute dissections, which are less than two weeks, or chronic dissections greater than two weeks old. 75% of deaths associated with aortic dissection occur in the first two weeks. The Stanford classification of dissection, so type A dissection is dissection that involves the ascending aorta. These are treated surgically. Uh, because you want to prevent complications that result in sudden death. Those complications are extension of dissection to the pericardium, leading to hemopericardium and tamponade, di extension of dissection to the aortic valve, which leads to acute aortic valvular regurgitation or extension to the coronary arteries. In the original Stanford classification, Stanford type B dissections were considered dissections distal to the left subclavian artery involving the descending thoracic aorta. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes. The DeBakey classification uh, type 2 involves the ascending aorta, type 3 descending aorta, and type 1 the entire aorta. So when we report an aortic dissection on CT, these are the things we want to look at. We want to decide, is it type A or type B? E? Is it going to require medical or surgical therapy? The extent of the dissection from beginning to end, great vessel involvement, does the dissection flap extend to the great vessels above the aortic arch? Branch vessel involvement by the dissection flap. We also want to look at the origins uh, of the vessels, especially in the abdomen. So the uh, celiac artery, superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric artery, the renal arteries, do they originate from the true lumen or the false lumen? We want to look at the size of the false lumen. Often the false lumen is larger, or usually the false lumen is larger than the true lumen. That can lead in some cases to compression of the true lumen and uh, obstruction of branch vessels that are coming off the true lumen, and that's called dynamic compression. Uh, we want to look and see if we can identify the entry tear, and also we look for fenestrations. We look for defects within the flap because those defects allow communication between the true lumen and the false lumen, and uh, they would uh, that would allow for persist persistent patency of the false lumen. And of course, we look for complications, hemopericardium. Also look at the renal perfusion, especially if the renal artery is coming off the false lumen, then that kidney may have decreased perfusion compared to the other kidney, and that will manifest as decreased enhancement of that kidney. So the uh, Stanford classification is the one that is most uh, widely used, just diagrammatically going over that again. So here's a classic type B dissection. We can see that it uh, involves a descending aorta. It begins right there, just distal to the left subclavian artery. Notice in this case, we can identify the entry tear, and it's not unusual now with the modern CT scanners because of the very rapid in terms of the imaging to be able to identify the entry tear. Here, notice that the dissection propagates forward from the entry tear as expected. However, this also, this also propagates retrograde from the entry tear, and it is not unusual for dissections like this for uh, these uh, classic type B dissections to, to their proximal extent to uh, uh, begin here just distal to the left subclavian artery. So what seems to happen is you get an entry tear anywhere here along the course of the descending aorta it propagates forward, but it also propagates retrograde and is stopped here at the origin of the left subclavian artery. Now, what about a dissection like this that involves the aortic arch but does not involve the ascending aorta. Is this a type A or a type B? Well, these are considered type B dissections with arch involvement. So these are treated medically. So again, any dissection that extends to the ascending aorta is a type A. Uh, however, if you have a dissection uh, that extends to the aortic arch or that begins within the aortic arch and does not extend to the ascending aorta, that is considered a type B dissection. We can call it type B with arch involvement, and these are treated medically.
Now on chest radiograph, dissections uh, of the aorta, this may present as acute widening uh, of the contour of the aorta, especially when you compare with prior films. You might notice displaced calcifications on the chest radiograph, although uh, those are very difficult findings to make on the chest radiograph. Of course, uh, CT is the imaging study of choice. Easy diagnosis with CT, we look for the dissection plap. As we've seen in the example we started with, uh, displaced intimal calcifications are an indication of dissection and that will separate the true lumen from the false lumen. The intimal flap itself can also extend into branch vessels. So here's an example where we see a type A dissection. There's a flap in ascending aorta, flap descending aorta. Here we see the flap here within the aortic arch. Notice that we can also see some extension of the dissection here into the left subclavian artery and also here into the right brachiocephalic artery. Here also notice a change in perfusion here. So the left kidney enhances better than the right kidney. So perfusion to the right kidney in this example has been impaired due to the dissection. Here's another dissection, and but here we have rupture. You can see that there is hematoma all around the mediastinum here surrounding the great vessel, surrounding the pulmonary artery. You can see the dissection flap here within the descending aorta. Uh, depending on, he, in this example, here at the aortic arch, we can see opacification of the false lumen. As we travel down distally now, it becomes difficult to separate thrombus uh, from uh, uh, thrombosed false lumen from opacified false lumen. And this has to do with the phase of the injection. If we scan a little bit too early, then it might not give enough time for the false lumen to opacify in these cases of dissection, in which case you cannot necessarily differentiate thrombus in the false lumen from a patent false lumen. Uh, it's still treated like a dissection, so clinically that may not matter much. In this example also, we can see that there is high attenuation pericardial fluid indicating that this patient has hemopericardium from extension of the dissection into the pericardium. Another example here of a ruptured type B dissection in this example. So you could see the on a non-contrast image, the hyperdense hematoma here within the aortic wall and also hematoma here or hemothorax here within the pleural space. And then here you can see the irregular contour here from the contrast at the location of the aortic rupture. So here's another example of a dissection in this here. And uh, what's kind of interesting here is that we can see the flap in the arch extending into the descending thoracic aorta, but also notice, so here's the false lumen, also notice uh, that the uh, this uh, dissection here does extend a little bit there into, uh, uh, into the ligamentum here arteriosum. And so uh, this uh, ligamentum here arteriosum uh, uh, here, the, uh, we can see the contrast extending into there as uh, that is being filled there by the, uh, by the false lumen. And uh, so sometimes these uh, dissections can extend uh, into that area also uh, coming off of the uh, proximal descending thoracic aorta. Uh, so here we have volume rendered views showing you that outpouching there where the dissection is extended into the ligamentum arteriosum where it is coming off here of the false lumen. Now, in this very same dissection, we can see it extending down the descending thoracic aorta. Notice also that the false lumen here is much larger than the true lumen. Also notice the uh, dissection flap here coming very close so the, to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. So the superior mesenteric artery here is originating from the true lumen, uh, but this dissection flap does come very close to occluding. You can see here also on the axial image, the superior mesenteric artery. Here, as we come down a little bit lower, here's the false lumen, there's the true lumen. You can see almost uh, complete obstruction here of the true lumen by the dissection flap. And you can see that some of that dissection flap actually uh, extends into the right common 
iliac artery there, producing some obstruction there of the right common iliac artery. And so here are the uh, sequential images there showing you the dissection flap. So here's false lumen, true lumen. You can see the dissection flap there and there kind of obstructing the origin of the right common iliac artery. Here it is on the coronal reformatted view. You can see what's happening there. And on the volume rendered view, you can see what that dissection flap is doing. So these are examples of dynamic compression. So what happens is the false lumen is often larger than the true lumen and can compress the true lumen. And where we have branch vessels coming off of the true lumen, you can see how the flap itself sometimes can, might occlude actually the branch vessels coming off of the true lumen, leading to perfusion abnormalities. And if this involves perfusion abnormalities, uh, we call this malperfusion syndrome. Uh, which will require therapy. Uh, what they might do for this is what what they can do is they want to keep they want to uh, increase the diameter of the true lumen. So one method of treating this is to create fenestrations here in the flap within the abdominal aorta, then allowing communications between the false and the true lumen in an effort to get blood flow into that true lumen and prevent the dissection flap. Uh, from collapsing the true lumen and uh, from occluding the branch vessels coming off of the true lumen. Here's another unusual appearance of a dissection. We can see that this patient has a type A dissection there in the ascending aorta. Here's a strange appearance of this dissection flap extending into the aortic arch. This patient also had a small hemopericardium. And here on the uh, these sagittal reformatted views, uh, you can see it looks like there's a lumen in a lumen here on this coronal image and then here on the sagittal image. You can see how this dissection flap itself is torn off and because the blood flow is going forward is being pushed into the uh, true lumen here. So this is a dissection flap. This is intersusception actually of a dissection flap. So here diaphragmatically is the representation. So this flap is torn off the ascending aorta and the blood flow going forward is pushing it during systole into the aortic arch. During diastole, it will actually fall backwards. And here's another unusual appearance from a dissection. This example here, we have a dissection in the ascending aorta that is uh, coming down here near the aortic valve. This patient did have aortic valvular regurgitation. Turns out the aortic valve is here, this part here, this part is, this is actually the dissection flap. And that's well demonstrated here on this echo. So here is the aortic valve here. And then here's the dissection flap. And you can see during systole, when the valve is open, the dissection flap is pushed forward. However, during diastole, that dissection flap prolapses downward into the aortic valve. And that's what was causing aortic valvular regurgitation in this patient. So this dissection flap has torn, torn off this part of the aorta. And during systole, of course, it goes forward. During diastole, it prolapses backward into the aortic valve, causing aortic regurgitation in this patient. Diagrammatically, here is the that representation. So you can see the dissection flap torn off here during systole. It goes forward during diastole prolapses backward into the aortic valve, resulting in aortic valvular regurgitation. Now, what study should we do if we suspect dissection of the ascending aorta? And we've kind of already touched on complications of dissections of the ascending aorta. Well, with the ascending aorta, you can have a lot of motion artifact without ECG gating. With ECG gating, though, no, you get a very uh, nice images here of the ascending aorta. So if we suspect dissections of the ascending aorta, you might want to do the study cardiac gated. The advantage of that is that you can visualize, you see the difference, you can visualize the dissection flap much better. You can also, it's also much easier to evaluate the ascending aorta. Uh, sometimes uh, mo motion uh, at the root of the aorta can be hard to differentiate a dissection from a normal aorta. In this example, there's a motion here on the non-gated study. Uh, hard to tell if there's a dissection here, but with cardiac gating, it's much easier to tell that the aorta there is normal. Again, another example here, even with cardiac gating, if we change our 
uh, our window where we're doing the reconstruction, that might also clear up uh, abnormalities that we might suspect. So in this example, uh, if we're questioning whether there is a, a pseudoaneurysm formation here, when we reconstruct at a slightly different window, we can see the sinus of Valsalva much better and determine that it is normal. So if we're dealing with the ascending aorta, uh, the best way to image that if we're looking for abnormalities, especially dissections, is with cardiac gated CT. The coronary artery that is most likely to be involved with dissections of the ascending aorta, uh, the dissection flaps tend, more often tend to come towards the right coronary artery than the left. So the right coronary artery is more likely to be involved if there is involvement of a coronary artery with dissection of the ascending aorta than the left coronary artery. So we have some examples of both here, the dissection flap coming down very close to the right coronary artery, in this example very close to the left, but if there's actual involvement of the coronary artery, it is more often right-sided. Now MR can also be used to image dissections, but it's very difficult uh, to interpret uh, because of slow flow and swirling flow, and then you will have all of these signal abnormalities here, especially within the false lumen, because of the uh, uh, because the flow there is slowed down, so MR can be especially on black blood imaging can be very hard to determine MR in geography though uh, much better. You can see the dissection flap demonstrated nicely, and here's the correlate with the CT on that particular case. Now the question might also come up: How do you differentiate the true lumen from the false lumen? Which is the true lumen? Which is the false lumen? Well, one one rule of thumb is that the false lumen is often larger than the true lumen, so that's usually a good rule of thumb. Now here's another example where we have false lumen and true lumen. Here uh, again, the false lumen is usually larger, but there is another uh, sign demonstrated here. Here we see these strands of tissue. Within the false lumen, these are called cobwebs. This is where the intima here has torn off the uh, wall of the aorta and brings with it these strands of tissue. So if we see strands of tissue like that within a lumen, we can also say that that is the false lumen. So differentiating the true lumen from false lumen, beak sign, larger luminal cross-sectional area, cobwebs. So these are ways of differentiating the true lumen from the false lumen. The beak sign almost always present. You might have a wedge of hematoma, or, but uh, you might have this kind of acute angle here. So that acute angle there, that indicates this is the false lumen side here of the dissection. And the uh, hematomas there will often occur on the false lumen side there of the dissection. The larger cross-sectional area, usually the false lumen is larger than the true lumen, and we might also have strands of tissue within the false lumen, and those are called cobwebs. So these cobwebs are ribbons of media that are sheared off by the dissection, and there's a very nice example of that here. Here's the false lumen. Here we can see these strands of tissue that have been sheared off by the dissection, and that gives us an indication that this is definitely the false lumen in this example. Sometimes we'll have these strange appearances when we look at the aortic arch where it looks like we have a lumen inside of another lumen. There, the inner lumen here is uh, these always the true lumen, the outer lumen is always the false lumen if you have an appearance like that within the aortic arch. So let's move on. What if we have a case like this? What do we notice here? On, on the non-contrast images, we notice this crescent of high attenuation within the wall of the aorta. This, of course, is intramural hematoma, and this is why in our dissection protocols, we will do a non-contrast CT before we do CT angiography because we want to look for uh, these intramural hematomas. So here's post-contrast CT. It can be Hard to say that that's a, definitely a hematoma on post-contrast CT, but on the pre-contrast CT, the hyperdense crescent sign is the sign of intramural hematoma. Sometimes if we narrow the windows, it's easier to see that difference in attenuation there uh, uh, of the intramural hematoma. And here, of course, post-contrast. So intramural hematoma is also associated with hypertension, and uh, the current thinking is that this is likely the result of a small intimal tear that we may not necessarily be able to see on the CT scan. So these, these uh, 
this, these have been uh, these have been identified uh, at surgery uh, and also at autopsy on these patients. That in uh, most cases of intramural hematomas, there is a small intimal tear. An older theory was that this represented hemorrhage of the vasovasorum there uh, within the wall of the aorta and led to the intramural hematoma. Now you can also see intramural hematomas with penetrating aortic ulcers, another one of the acute aortic syndromes, which. Uh, we will cover in a few minutes. So on non-contrast CT, the high attenuation crescent, we may see displacement of intimal calcification. And uh, on post-contrast CT, of course, this will be low in attenuation, but again, you can see the displaced uh, intimal calcifications there. You can also make the diagnosis on T1-weighted MR. So you can see the high signal there on T1-weighted MR representing an acute intramural hematoma. In this example, six days later, that transformed into a full-blown dissection. Now, intramural hematomas, uh, these are often treated or usually treated just like aortic dissections. These are dissection equivalents. And uh, sometimes they can get better on their own. So here's an example of a healing intramural hematoma over time. As we see here, seven months later, it is completely healed. Is an, is an example of a patient with a dissection, and we can see here on a non-contrast CT, there is some hematoma here in the wall of the aorta, but uh, my question is, why does it look like the wall of the pulmonary artery here is also thickened in this patient who has a dissection? And then here's more images in another case of dissection. Notice on the non-contrast images, there's this high attenuation crescent also involving the wall of the pulmonary artery. So what is going on here? Well, it turns out that the aorta and the pulmonary artery share in adventitia. So if there's hematoma within the wall of the aorta, that can extend to the pulmonary artery, and it can sometimes circumferentially involve the pulmonary artery, as in this example here. Here's another example, uh, dissection here of the ascending aorta, hematoma around the aorta extending to the wall of the pulmonary artery, in this case causing severe narrowing there of the pulmonary artery. Remember in embryology, both the aorta and the pulmonary artery uh, begin as the truncus arteriosus, which divides into the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and so they share the adventitia. So hematoma around the ascending aorta can extend to the pulmonary artery. Here you can actually see contrast extending into the wall there of the pulmonary artery where there's a communication. And sometimes also we might see parabronchovascular bleeding. This is this ground glass attenuation surrounding the hilar vessels, actually representing a bleeding extending from the aorta around the pulmonary arteries and then around into the hilar areas. Here's another example of dissection with hematoma around the pulmonary artery, uh, around the ascending aorta extending to the pulmonary artery. And in severe cases, that can actually lead to obstruction of flow through the pulmonary artery. Okay, so let's move on here. We have two patients with intramural hematomas with contrast collections. So what is the difference and what is the significance? So if we look at these contrast collections, here's one within the intramural hematoma there. This one has a very narrow connection with the aortic lumen. This one here has a wider mouth there where it communicates with the aortic lumen. This one also very close to this uh, or it's coming off here where there's the intercostal artery. So what are we dealing with? This is an example of an intramural blood pool. This represents a pseudoaneurysm of a branch vessel, commonly the intercostal artery, as we, as we see here, secondary to intramural hematoma. So what happens is when we have an intramural hematoma, the extension of blood here goes around the origin of this branch vessel, this intercostal vessel, and we will see then this dilatation here, actually a small aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm formation there at the origin of this branch vessel. And it turns out, so we can differentiate these because it has a very uh, narrow neck here where it communicates with the aorta as a small orifice and uh, often associated with a branch vessel like the intercostal artery. It turns out that, that these tend to be benign. These uh, most resolve over time and these are not associated with a poor prognosis. As opposed to an ulcer-like projection that has a wide mouth, uh, 
So these have a wider mouth. This represents actual disruption of the intima. And these may not be noted on the original CT when the patient has the uh, intramural hematoma. Uh, that's why these patients require a follow-up uh, to assess what's happening to the intramural hematoma and to look for complications. So here is an ulcer-like projection. And uh, you can see uh, here that it kind of... Uh, uh, here at 10 days, we can see the ulcer-like projection, and here at one, at one month, we can see that uh, it has progressed. So this represents a site of intimal disruption. These can enlarge over time, and this is associated with poorer prognosis. So these require close, close CT follow-up to look for progression of that ulcer-like projection. Now, what about a case like this? It looks like there's uh, something here in the wall of the aorta, and here there's some contrast in there. And on this sagittal reconstruction, we can see here uh, what looks like a contrast extending out beyond the walls of the aorta surrounded by intramural hematoma. Well, this is a penetrating aortic ulcer. So these penetrating aortic ulcers uh, usually start out as ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque that penetrates the internal elastic lamina, and that results in hematoma here of the aortic wall. Again, associated with hypertension and diffuse systemic atherosclerosis. And the problem with these is that these can also progress the formation of pseudoaneurysm and eventually rupture. These can enlarge over time, so these also will require follow-up. Uh, they might present with pain, just like aortic dissection, so this is also considered one of the acute aortic syndromes. So here's an example here, focal ulcer-like collection of contrast. It is beyond the normal contour of the aorta. These are usually associated with intramural hematoma, as in this example. Here's an MR angiography showing you it looks just like an ulcer that you might see on a GI study when we're looking at bowel. Now, is this a penetrating aortic ulcer? Well, the key thing is you want to determine, is it extending beyond the contours of the aorta? So here there is atherosclerotic disease. This is not extending beyond the contours of the aorta. This is just an ulcerated plaque. This could progress if it extends further to a penetrating aortic ulcer, but at this stage, this is just ulcerated plaque. You need to be able to differentiate uh, ulcerated plaque from penetrating aortic ulcer. Two examples here of ulcerated plaque. This does not extend beyond the normal contours of the aorta. Therefore, we would call this ulcerated plaque and not a penetrating aortic ulcer. Here's an example of penetrating ulcer, intramural hematoma. And you can see here how it has progressed 14 days later. And then 35 days later, we have a very complicated appearing pseudoaneurysm where we had a penetrating aortic ulcer. All right, let's talk about a little bit about surgery for dissections that involve the ascending aorta. So here's somebody with a type A dissection, quite extensive. You can see extending down the descending thoracic aorta. So a uh, technique that is uh, used is a modified bental or total aortic root technique. So in this technique, they, if they need to replace the aortic valve because the dissection has come come too close to the valve or the valve has been involved. So they will put in this graft that includes a aortic valve here and they will also reimplant the coronary arteries onto that graft. So a portion of the ascending aorta here is replaced with a graft. Again, the idea there is to prevent those complications uh, from dissections of the ascending aortic extension to the pericardium, extension to the aortic valve, and extension to the coronary arteries from occurring. The remainder of the dissection, though, is left in place, and the patient will be followed to assess what happens to the remainder of the dissection. There's also an inclusion root technique here uh, where we have, uh, where we place the uh, the graft is placed here and they wrap the native aorta here with the coronary arteries uh, around it. Uh, again, uh, this uh, uh, does, in, does involve here some stitching around the uh, origins of the coronary arteries to the graft itself. And then uh, if surgery is required on the aortic arch, we have these complicated aortic arch grafts that can also be placed uh, for these patients. And one peculiar type is called an elephant trunk, where it has a portion of the graft that kind of dangles down like this. So uh, this is done if they, 
uh, need to go back later and repair the descending thoracic aorta since all of this surgery cannot be done at the same time. They will repair the ascending aorta and the arch at one surgery, leave this elephant trunk in place, and then this portion of the graft will be used later to repair the descending thoracic aorta um, at a future date. So when you have a graft that hangs down like that into the descending aorta, that is called an elephant trunk graft, can give you a very peculiar appearance on a CT scan. Okay, so back to our patient who had this uh, dissection, uh, type A dissection involving the ascending aorta. And this is a freshly post-op. You can see there's a little bit of gas there around the ascending aorta. And so there's surgical material around where the anastomosis was done here in the ascending aorta and where the graft was placed. Notice that the remainder of the dissection is left in place. So these patients will be followed uh, by serial CTs over time. The natural course is uh, for the false lumen to enlarge over time. So that will be followed. And if it gets to a certain size, then at that point intervention may be required. So here on this patient after their surgery, you can see here, this is the graft itself. It's marked by this surgical material proximally and distally marking the proximal and distal anastomosis here, nicely demonstrated on this coronal here. Uh, you can, this patient did not require aortic valve replacement, so they replaced this portion of the ascending aorta with a graft. Now that's why it's important to do non-contrast imaging first on these patients that you know have had surgery because you want to be able to identify the surgical material. You don't want to mistake that for extravasation of contrast. You can have felt rings here, and then here it is after contrast. So you don't want to, uh, you don't want to mistake that for an abnormality of the aorta. So you want to be identify, identify all of this radio opaque surgical material on your pre-contrast scan before you try to interpret uh, the post-contrast imaging. So here's a felt ring, there's a felt pledget there. Um, uh, so you want to be able to identify that surgical material. So this patient had a history of recent aortic surgery. And what do we think? Well, we notice that the ascending aorta, there's all this hematoma around the ascending aorta has this kind of funny contour. And then here there is extravasated contrast here outside the aorta, there's hematoma extending down there near the right atrium. So here we can see the contrast extravasating. This patient did have uh, an aortic valve replacement here along with the graft that was placed, but there's been dehiscence here and there is extravasation of contrast leading to that large mediastinal hematoma. So with graft dehiscence, we might see large hematoma around the graft and then you will see contrast there that uh, if there's active bleeding actually extravasating outside of the ascending aorta. Graft infection. Uh, if we see a fluid collection around the graft, especially if there are air bubbles in there uh, from gas forming organisms, you should not have uh, air within the mediastinum more than two weeks after surgery. And uh, if we see fluid collections with air bubbles in a postoperative patient uh, uh, more than two weeks after surgery, we do need to consider complications like graft infection. Well, let's look at this interesting case. So this patient has this obvious contour abnormality there of the descending thoracic aorta. There's this large penetrating aortic ulcer with this big hematoma there in the descending thoracic aorta. And here it is. You can see that large ulcer with the hematoma and the descending thoracic aorta. A volume rendered view showing you uh, that, uh, that very large abnormality. And this patient was treated with a stent graft. But what you can see here is even after the stent graft, there is an endoleak. We can still see that some contrast there is getting outside there into the mediastinum. Still the mediastinal hematoma is still there here in the volume rendered view. You can see where that endoleak is. And uh, now with modern CT techniques, we can, we can do these, uh, take these kind of uh, endoluminal views through the, uh, through the aorta, looking at the stent graft itself, uh, looking at the integrity of the graft from the inside. So this is kind of virtual angioscopy, if you will. And uh, there's a little hole there, which is uh, where the endoleak uh, was produced. And here we can actually come down and go actually through that hole where this patient had the endoleak.
Okay, so let's move on. Here's a patient who's had a motor vehicle accident. And of course, we notice widening of the mediastinum. Another patient with motor vehicle accident. This one's a little bit more subtle. Again, there's a little bit tough to tell here whether the mediastinum is abnormal, but it does look like there's a little bit of widening. But of course, now all of these patients are, are going to get CT scans of the chest looking for traumatic aortic injury. So the widening of the mediastinum is caused by mediastinal hematoma here around the aorta. And with CT, we can actually uh, localize and see the sites of injury, uh, these, uh, these areas where the uh, aorta has been disrupted. So we don't want to, we, we don't try to decide to call these aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms or dissections. We just put them all under the heading of traumatic aortic injury. So here we can see large mediastinal hematoma and you can see the disruption there of the aorta in this particular case. On the volume rendered view, you can see the disruption of the aorta here looking from the top down. You can see that outpouching and disruption of the aorta in this particular case. So thoracic aortic injury uh, from uh, sudden deceleration injury from motor vehicle accidents, 90% will occur near the aortic isthmus between the origin of the left subclavian artery and the attachment of the ligamentum arteriosum. The hematoma may be contained initially, but there's high risk for rupture, especially within the first 24 hours. So these patients may be stable initially, uh, which is why it's very important to look for these with CT in a patient who's been involved in a serious motor vehicle accident. The signs on chest radiographs, uh, widening of the mediastinum, very important sign is loss of the contour of the aortic knob. So uh, the aortic knob, if it's not well defined, that can be a sign of mediastinal hematoma, deviation of the trachea, deviation of nasogastric tube, depression of left main bronchus. Uh, but of course, the, this is no longer, you know, we don't try to diagnose these with chest radiograph. All of these patients go to CT. So on CT, we look for mediastinal hematoma, and uh, usually we can see the direct signs of injury. We might see contrast extravasation or pseudoaneurysm, intimal flaps, abrupt caliber changes, pseudocoarctation, uh, focal occlusion, segments of arch branches. CT is nearly 100% sensitive and 87% specific for traumatic aortic injury. There are some cases where you might see mediastinal hematoma, but don't directly visualize aortic injury. There the injury, the mediastinal hematoma might be caused by venous bleeding and not necessarily by aortic injury. So on CT, mediastinal hematoma, if we see that, we're going to be very suspicious and evaluate the thoracic aorta very carefully. Any irregularities we see in the aorta, then we will assume represent uh, traumatic aortic injury. And uh, in patients where this is not diagnosed, and if the patients are lucky and survive, they can develop as a complication uh, pseudoaneurysm uh, in this location. So a pseudoaneurysm in this location, ask for a remote hit history of motor vehicle accident, aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm in that location. If for whatever reason you just happen to image the abdomen and pelvis in a trauma patient and notice a periaortic hematoma, go back and image the chest because you may have a traumatic aortic injury where we have periaortic hematoma that is extending down into the abdomen in those cases. So it's another case of a motor vehicle accident, but what do we think of a case like this? Well, there's no hematoma surrounding the aorta. However, it does look like there's this intimal irregularity here in the aorta, but there is no contour abnormality along the wall of the aorta. So what do we call this? This is called minimal aortic injury. This is where we have an intraluminal intimal flap or clot. There's no irregularity of the aortic contour, no intramural hematoma, no mediastinal hematoma. The significance of this is that this can be treated non-operatively and conservatively, where what we would do here is do serial CT follow-ups in this patient to look to make sure that this does not progress and this may heal on its own. So this is minimal aortic injury, very important. If we see an intimal irregularity, look for mediastinal hematoma, look for any contour abnormalities of the aorta. If we don't have any of that, then we may be dealing with minimal aortic injury, which can be treated non-operatively. Now the Society for Vascular Surgery does grade uh, traumatic aortic injury. So grade one is when we have just an intimal tear or minimal aortic injury. 
Grade two, we have an intramural hematoma, as in this example here. Grade three, we have a pseudoaneurysm here, uh, but there is no bleeding outside of the aorta. And grade four is when you have rupture. In that case, you actually have bleeding outside of the aorta. So you have hematoma in the mediastinum. In this example, we actually have extravasation of contrast here, active bleeding there into the mediastinum. And there we just have rupture of the aorta. Now, these can now be treated with aortic stent grafts. So the important thing is to cover the area of injury and exclude that from the blood pool. And um, it's very important to localize the injury, also its location to the subclavian artery. In certain cases, it may be necessary, depending on the location of the injury, to cover the subclavian artery. So for preoperative planning in these cases, you want to look at the aortic arch anatomy, look for anomalous arch vessels, want to look at the course of the common carotid artery and vertebral artery, look for vertebral artery dominance, which vertebral artery is larger, that of course will be the dominant vertebral artery, circle of uh, Willis, basal vertebral system anatomy and, and completeness, if you happen to look at that, uh, if you have uh, CTs of the brain there. Uh, look for any evidence of bypass grafts to the internal mammary artery. That's going to be important if you need to cover the subclavian artery. So you don't want to necessarily cover a subclavian artery where you have a bypass graft coming off of the subclavian artery. So also we need to look at the injury location relative to the left subclavian artery. You would want some distance from the subclavian artery because you, you, you try to avoid covering the subclavian artery and also the length of the injury on your your uh, multiplanar reformatted views. So for preoperative planning, we look at the diameter of the aorta, one centimeter proximal, one centimeter distal to the injury. That will determine the diameter of the stent. Often they oversized the stent to achieve a good seal uh, uh, with the aorta. Um, angulation of the aortic arch, that can result in poor apposition of the endograft. Um, the caliber of the access site, you know, they, they usually go through the femoral artery, should be greater than six to nine millimeters. Atherosclerotic calcification stenosis or tortuosity of access vessels uh, can be important. Follow-up CTs, usually CT before discharge, three to six months, one year, and then annual. So with the CT endografts, uh, the graft is usually a covered graft. The lumen should be patent without sharp angulation. The, the stent should be opposed to the uh, aortic intima along the entire course, especially the proximal and distal ends. And we don't, want this, we don't want the graft to migrate. And we want the most important thing is that the pseudoaneurysm where the tear is should be stable in size and, and it should be excluded from the contrast flow. So you have a graft that is placed. There should be good opposition of the graft with the aortic wall, and there should be no contrast outside of the graft because you want to exclude the injured aorta from the blood pool. Complications of endografts can be endoleak, collapse, uh, with the branch vessels, if they're covered, strokes, upper extremity ischemia or paraplegia, if, if, the, if there's complication to the spinal artery, graft infection, of course, structural failure, failure to exclude the pseudoaneurysm if the graft is displaced or if the, or if the graft migrates away from the pseudoaneurysm, and then there are access sites complications like thrombus infection and dissection. Now for follow-up, we look for evidence of endoleaks. So here we see contrast outside of the graft. This is, this is a type 1 endoleak occurring from proximally here, uh, type 1a endoleak in this example as the contrast is going outside of the endograft here proximally. So what are the different types of endoleaks? The endoleak is the most common complication. The problem is, is that it exposes the injured aorta to arterial pressure, and it may require an overlapping stent to prevent the endoleak. So type 1 is we, if we have an inadequate seal, if it's proximal, it's type 1A. If it's distal, type 1B. Type 2, if there's retrograde flow from a collateral vessel, that can occur with coverage of a subclavian artery. If there's retrograde flow in the subclavian artery, that flow can come down and go around the stent uh, and then the injured lumen then is no longer exposed from the blood pool. Type 3, disruption or of the graft structure itself, and type 4 is porosity of the graft 
fabric. So if we look at this example, this endograft has been placed. What are problems here? Well, one is left subclavian artery here is covered. Um, and often these patients do well with coverage of the subclavian artery. But another problem is this configuration here. You see that uh, there you, we don't have a, a tight seal here between the endograft and the aortic wall. This is called a bird beak con configuration here. And that allows then, um, this has been associated with complications of endograft as this pulsatile flow that keeps hitting the endograft here uh, can eventually either collapse the endograft or might dissect portion of it away from the uh, aortic wall. So complications of covering the uh, subclavian artery, of course, you can get ischemia to the, to the limb and uh, you can get uh, vertebral steel. Steel syndromes can occur, but often these patients do well with coverage of the left subclavian artery. So uh, things that you'd want to evaluate, of course, you want to evaluate the vertebral artery if we're if we're contemplating covering the uh, subclavian artery on that side. You don't necessarily want to cover the subclavian artery if the vertebral artery is dominant or the circle of Willis is not complete. Um, and in those cases, uh, you might have to do some kind of bypass, uh, carotid to subclavian bypass, uh, when you cover the subclavian artery with the stent graft. So um, you need a wide landing zone between the injury and the left subclavian artery, complications of covering the subclavian. Of course, you have the increased risk of a type 2 endoleak because the Blood flow can come down here from the subclavian retrograde and might dissect around the endograft, give you a type 2 leak. Stroke, left upper extremity claudication, subclavian steel. Although, as we've said, most patients tend to do well. You want to evaluate for left vertebral artery dominance, a barren right subclavian artery, incomplete circle of Willis, or, or the basal vertebral system. And of course, look for any uh, bypass grafts. Uh, you don't want to impair flow to a bypass graft by covering the uh, subclavian artery, especially uh, a lima graft, because the internal mammary artery does come off the subclavian artery. Um, there are more modern grafts that have been constructed with proximal fenestrations that will allow flow to the subclavian artery uh, when you do cover the subclavian artery, though, with, uh, with some uh, custom-made graphs. So that's our discussion of the acute aortic syndromes. So I thank you for your attention and we will see you next time.